Welcome, I'm Dr. Stephen Burns from Londonderry, New Hampshire. Today we're going to be discussing large diameter gas permeable lenses, lenses that fit beyond the limbus. These are lenses that are going to allow you to vault to successful levels for your gas permeable lens patients, for your specialty lens patients. In particular, we're discussing the MSD design lens that is manufactured and distributed by Blanchard Contact Lens. Fitting this lens for me has been a process of evolution. Over the course of the last seven years, I fit many patients with this lens. My success rate is very high. And with the evolution of the designs that we're gonna talk about today, I'm gonna tell you how you can be successful in fitting your patients with irregular cornea, with dry eye, with other pathologic conditions, and have a very high level of success. When should I fit the mini scleral design lens or a scleral lens? Well, keratoconus is a condition that we see quite frequently, and I fit all my keratoconic patients. I, this is my first choice now. I used to try to fit small corneal lenses, but I find that the, uh, these lenses provide much better comfort, and comfort is always a key critical um, attribute of the lens that we've always been trying to improve. Pellucid marginal degeneration, very tough uh, corneal condition to fit with a corneal design lens due to the lower displaced apex of the cornea. These lenses totally vault that area, they center on the sclera, so we have well-centered optics. Post-surgical corneas are very easy to fit. We're able to um, adjust the sagittal height of the lens so that it vaults over wherever the sutured area is on the cornea or where the graftose junction is, and we're able to uh, maintain a lens fitting on the eye with absolutely no corneal touch. Post-refractive uh, patients, uh, particularly RK patients and LASIK patients, are actually fairly easily fit with this lens. Steven Johnson syndrome is a condition where scleral lenses are really the treatment of choice. Dry eye patients are always um, difficult fits with uh, both corneal gas permeable lenses and with soft lenses. And the reason is the lenses tend to dry or the eyes dry throughout the day. The cornea gets irritated and red with uh, the gas permeable lenses. The optics of the soft lens tend to degrade as the lens dries out. This lens, or scleral lenses in general, we vault the cornea and we maintain a fluid layer between the cornea and the contact lens. This keeps the cornea hydrated, the eye remains comfortable, and uh, because it's a gas permeable material, drying of the uh, ocular surface or of the contact lens surface really doesn't cause any change in the optics. We've all seen patients with neovascularization secondary to hybrid lens wear, and that's due to the low decay of the hybrid skirt. This lens has a high decay from edge to edge. With the XO2, as I said, it has a decay of 141. The lens can also be used for corneal protection. It's also used for patients who have poor comfort with traditional corneal design lenses. I used to do piggyback fits uh, for my patients who did not get good comfort but had to wear a corneal lens. Well, this totally replaces the need for a piggyback fit. And for those fits and the failures that I have had, I've reintroduced them to contact lenses and they're very successful. High myopic refractive errors are interesting because with this lens, I'm able to put two lenses on the eye. The fluid layer, the fluid lens between the cornea and the contact lens actually can be designed to have power to help, help correct the myopic correction. And so I don't have to use as high a gas permeable lens power. I can put part of the correction in the tear layer and part of the correction into the gas permeable lens. So all refractive errors, including presbyopia, are good choices for this design. Now one of the added benefits of fitting beyond the limbus, vaulting the cornea, is that we eliminate the problem of spectacle blur and corneal warpage, which we have with traditional lenses that rest on the cornea. How does the patient benefit 
from this mini scleral lens design? Well, initial comfort and long-term comfort are really key. One of the things that I do is I put the lens on the patient's eye and I ask the patient, I want you to tell me how comfortable is this lens? And here's your scale. One, it's totally uncomfortable. I cannot stand it. Get it off my eye. Ten, I don't know it's there. Surprisingly, this lens usually gets around an eight or a nine on initial application to the eye. And by the time I've gone through the over-refraction or perfected the fit, it's nine or 10. Next, the optics remain centered and the visual acuity remains constant because this lens doesn't move around on the eye. It stays centered with the optics in front of the visual axis. Patients who wear gas permeable lenses are very accustomed to on a windy day or just when things aren't right, they get something behind their lens and it feels like a grain of sand or it feels, some people say it feels like a rock behind their lens. Well, these lenses don't allow any foreign bodies to get behind them because of the way the lens is fit and has a semi-sealed uh, type of arrangement over the conjunctiva. The cornea remains healthy because there's no corneal desiccation. I have some patients who um, have keratoconus or pellucid and they're very limited in, their, in what they can see with side vision. Not because they have decreased visual fields, but because of their inability to move their head or, or move their eyes and specifically, they have to use fully, uh, fully use head movement to look from side to side in order to keep the lenses from falling off their eyes or displacing. These lenses eliminate that problem so the patient has a more normal way of being able to, say, look in their rear view mirror of their car when they're backing up. As I've already mentioned, we don't have a problem with spectacle blur. And the lenses are stable. They're not going to fall out, so you're not going to have a patient looking around for the lenses in the middle of uh, the day or when they're driving. If they rub their eye, they don't have the lens pop out. These lenses have extremely good stability. For the patient to be successful with any beyond the limbus lens, it is imperative that you as the practitioner are comfortable and confident in applying and removing the lens and that you train the patient in these techniques. We're gonna go through some techniques of how to put the lens on, how to remove it from the practitioner's point of view and also from the patient's point of view. There are certain things that we need to do. First, there's a number of ways that you as the clinician can apply the lens to the eye. My uh, preferred way is to hold the lens with one of these green suction cups, fill the lens fully with non-preserved sterile saline, and apply the lens to the patient's eye. With this type of a device, I'm able to hold on to the lens slightly, so if the patient blinks or closes their eye, I'm not gonna have the lens wind up on the floor. I'm able to control where that lens is going. So I fill the lens completely with this non-preserved sterile saline. I fill it to the rim. Here I am putting it on my own eye. I retract the lower lid. I look directly down at the floor. I look directly into the lens at the center of that suction cup I apply it to the eye, I squeeze the bulb to release it. To remove the lens, I use a smaller device, and there I took the lens off. Notice how the lens was um, not centered, the device was not centered on the lens. For uh, the patient who does not want to use the device putting the lens on, you can use it, the fingers, the three tripod method. Removal of the lens, you can also use that large suction device. Now let's just think about how I put the, those lenses on, how I remove the lenses. Notice that when I'm removing the lens, I always place the suction device at the edge of the lens. I lift out like I'm opening up a cabinet door. I don't directly pull uh, the suction device in the lens like I'm trying to clear a drain. I want to uh, have this lens come off the eye with as little um, irritation as possible. It's not always possible to get it off without having a little bit of a sort of pop or 
where we got negative pressure behind the lens, but we want to really minimize that because this is the patient's most uncomfortable time when it's done improperly, and it's really a big nothing when you do it the right way. We don't want to increase discomfort in any way. So applying the lens to the eye and removing the lens is something that you really should practice before you start working with your first patient. Here I have a patient that I'm going to apply the lens to the eye. Now when I initially started fitting lenses, I would put fluorescein in with my lens when I was fitting the patient. It does help to be able to see the fit. Today, I'm going to show you reasons to do that and reasons not to do that. It'll be your choice. But here, I'm filling the lens again with a non-preserved sterile saline. I'm going to take a fluorescein strip and just quickly dip it in to get some fluorescence of the tear layer, of the fluid layer. I have the patient look directly down at the floor. I retract the upper and lower eyelids, and here I'm using the tripod method, my three fingers holding the lens. I place the lens on the eye, and because I have fluorescein, I always have a tissue with me to ensure that anything that's spilling over doesn't get on the patient's clothes. It might not be a bad idea, if you're putting the lens in with fluorescein, to have the patient have a paper towel or something in their lap, because you're going to get some excess uh, fluid that comes out of the eye. Now I'm going to remove the lens with the small uh, DMV device. I get the lens towards the edge and I just lift out like I'm opening up a cabinet door. I'm using that motion of lifting away from the eye, getting the lens at the uh, mid-peripheral portion of the lens so that I don't have a um, plunger effect, but I'm actually lifting the lens off the eye. Now what are the advantages of vaulting the cornea? Well, the first advantage is we've got corneal protection from dryness and abrasion. If you have a patient with intern lashes, this is a great way of protecting the eye. If you have a patient with dry eye and they develop corneal staining and they have problems using drops throughout the day, this is a correction for that. When you vault the cornea, you don't create any pressure points on the cornea as you do with corneal gas permeable lenses. So you don't have spectacle blur. So the transition between eyeglasses and contact lenses is seamless. Because the lens totally vaults the cornea, fitting beyond the limbus, and allows for just a mild amount of tear exchange, we don't get foreign bodies under the lens. In fact, if you do have a foreign body under the lens, it's floating in a pool of fluid and the patient can't feel it. The lens provides stable and centered optics because it fits beyond the cornea on the sclera and maintains that position throughout the day. So optically, this is a terrific device. Most importantly, when it comes to fitting irregular corneas, it's easy. All you do is vault it. So all those gyrations that you'd go through with your corneal lenses trying to get a uh, lens to fit over irregular surfaces and making changes uh, in different zones can all be put aside. Just vault the cornea. And perhaps one of the most important things, and you'll learn this if you put the lens on yourself, on your own eye, there is no discomfort or adaptation issues with these lenses. They're comfortable from the moment you put them in till the moment you take them out. <music>